Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing the adenylyl cyclase protein kinase A pathway. Okay, so we're currently in the process of discussing the protein kinase A holoenzyme, which is this complex made by uh, joining together four separate proteins. Firstly, you dimerize two regulatory subunits of protein kinase A together via their docking and dimerization domains. Then you attach onto the uh, PKA inhibitor sites of the two regulatory subunits in the regulatory subunit dimer, you attach catalytic subunits of protein kinase A. Okay, and we discussed that uh, there are four different regulatory subunits of protein kinase A divided up into two families, the type 1 regulatory subunits and the type 2 regulatory subunits. In the type 1 regulatory subunit family, you have the type 1 regulatory subunit alpha and the type 1 regulatory subunit beta. Now, with regards to dimerizing these together, you can either form homodimers, for instance, you can form a homodimer of the uh, type 1 regulatory subunit alpha, okay, in which you have two type 1 regulatory subunit alphas uh, dimerized together, or you form a homodimer of type 1 regulatory subunit beta, in which you have two type 1 regulatory subunit betas dimerized together. Alternatively, you can also form heterodimers in which you have one type 1 regulatory subunit alpha dimerized to one type 1 regulatory subunit beta. Alternatively, you can use type 2 regulatory subunits uh, to make your regulatory subunit dimer. And in this case, you have to make homodimers. You can either make a homodimer of the type 2 regulatory subunit alpha, or you can make a homodimer of the type 2 regulatory subunit beta. Okay, right. Uh, and then you attach on catalytic subunits, and there are three different catalytic subunits you can use in each of these sites. The catalytic subunit of protein kinase A alpha, and the catalytic subunit of protein kinase C beta, sorry, protein kinase A uh, beta, and the catalytic subunit of protein kinase A gamma. Okay, right. Uh, so, what I want to begin with is telling you the functional significance between type 1 protein kinase A holoenzymes, where the type where the regulatory subunit dimer is made up of type 1 regulatory subunits, and then type 2 protein kinase A holoenzymes, in which the regulatory subunit dimer is made up of type 2 regulatory subunits. Okay, right. Basically, type one regulate sorry type one protein kinase A holoenzymes are going to be free within the cytoplasm because the type one uh, regulatory uh, subunits don't have a very high affinity for proteins which bind them to the membrane. Whereas the type 2 protein kinase A holoenzymes, these have a much higher affinity for a certain class of protein which can bind them and then attach them to the cell membrane, basically. Okay, so these ones are generally localized at cell membranes, or indeed membranes of organelles within the cell. Okay, so what are these proteins which can uh, anchor type 2 regulatory subunits of protein kinase A and therefore type 2 protein kinase A holoenzymes at the uh, membranes of the cell? Well, basically, they're a type of protein known as an A kinase anchoring protein. Okay, so if this represents the inner and outer leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer, and let's say this is the cell membrane, but it could be the membrane of an intracellular organelle, okay, you have a certain type of protein, well, you have many different types of these proteins, uh, and they are attached to the cell membrane or other membranes within the cell, and they are called ACAPs, and this stands for A kinase anchoring protein. So the first A is for A, the K is for kinase, okay, so this, this refers to protein kinase A. Then the second A is for anchoring, okay, and then the P is for protein, so A kinase anchoring protein, or ACAP. Now, there, as I said, there is not just one A kinase anchoring protein, there is actually around 50 known within humans, okay? Uh, so, um, there's a lot of these things, basically. And they combined to this 
docking and dimerization domain. Now they bind to the combination of two of these together. So an A kinase anchoring protein can bind to this dimerized docking and dimerization domain. So if you take two uh, type 2 regulatory subunits and bind them together to make a dimer like so, then the uh, dimer of the docking and dimerization domains of those regulatory subunits can then bind to an A kinase anchoring protein. So basically, type 2 protein kinase A holoenzymes end up bound to these A kinase anchoring proteins, whilst type 1 protein kinase A holoenzymes, those remain free within the cytoplasm of the cell. Okay, right. So that's the functional difference between type 1 and type 2 regulatory subunits of protein kinase A, and therefore the type 1 and type 2 protein kinase A holoenzymes. Okay, we now want to discuss what happens when you activate a protein kinase A holoenzyme. Okay, so basically, in fact, let's go back to our picture. Basically, what's going to happen is when cyclic AMP goes up, it's going to bind to the cyclic AMP binding domains of the protein kinase A holoenzyme. Okay, what that will trigger is it will trigger a conformational change in the regulatory subunit. That means that the regulatory subunit cleaves away from the catalytic subunit. Okay, so the catalytic subunits are released. Now, it is these catalytic subunits that are actually going to uh, do what protein kinase A does, which is phosphorylate uh, serine and threonine residues of proteins. Okay, now when the catalytic subunits are bound to the protein kinase A inhibitor sites of the regulatory subunits within this regulatory dimer, uh, they cannot phosphorylate serine and threonine residues, they are inactive. Okay, however, when two cyclic AMPs bind here and two cyclic AMPs bind here, those catalytic subunits will be cleaved off basically, they'll be released. Okay. And they'll then be active. They'll go and uh, phosphorylate serine and threonine residues within proteins. So let me draw this. So let's redraw our protein kinase A holoenzyme, but now with cyclic AMP bound to it. Okay, so we'll start off with the amino terminal um, terminals of our two regulatory subunits of protein kinase A. And here are the two dimerization and docking domains. And by the way, the reason it's called, um, sorry, it's a docking and dimerization domain, I think. Docking and dimerization domain, yes. The reason this docking comes into it is because these are the sites which can bind to A kinase anchoring proteins. Okay, so effectively these are the sites which are responsible for docking the uh, type 2 protein kinase A holoenzymes at uh, A kinase anchoring proteins. And it's slightly unfair to say that type 1 protein kinase A's don't dock at A caps. They do dock at A caps, it's just they have a much lower affinity for binding to most A kinase anchoring proteins than the type 2 protein kinase A holoenzymes. So generally, as a general rule, type 1 protein kinase A holoenzymes will be found free in the cytoplasm of the cell, whilst type 2 protein kinase A holoenzymes will be found uh, docked to A kinase anchoring proteins. Okay, right. So, here are the docking and dimerization domains then. Uh, then we have our two protein kinase A inhibitor sites, one here and then the other one coming off here. Okay, so let's put some colour on this. So we'll have in turquoise here, these are our docking and dimerization domains here. Okay, dimerized together. In purple here, we have our protein kinase A inhibitor site. Okay. And uh, then moving on now, our cyclic AMP binding sites have now bound cyclic AMP, and I want to show a drastic conformational change in the regulatory subunit. So I'm going to show them having changed from being in this L shape to being uh, in a straight line. So this will represent the conformational change that the regulatory subunit of protein kinase A undergoes when cyclic AMP binds to these cyclic AMP binding sites. Okay, and I will represent the cyclic AMP molecules by these oval shapes.
Okay, so here in green, these are the cyclic AMP molecules in green here. Okay, so I've demoted them somewhat from being represented by that image we drew when we were discussing the cyclase reaction. Okay, so here is the cyclic AMP, and it's binding, well, it's bound, rather, to these uh, cyclic AMP uh, binding domains here in blue, of which we have two. So overall, two cyclic AMP molecules will bind to each of the uh, regulatory subunits of protein kinase A. Okay, and the same is true on this side. Here is one of these cyclic AMP binding domains. Here is the second one, and then we'll have the C-terminus. Okay, I'll just draw a C there. In fact, I could draw it actually out like this to get around the problem of having too little space. There we go. And now we have cyclic AMP bound here and cyclic AMP bound here. Okay, so let's colour this in. These are our cyclic AMP molecules in green here. And then we have our cyclic AMP binding domains in blue here. Okay, right, so this is now our active uh, protein kinase A. And now the um, regulatory subunit dimer here no longer has the catalytic subunits bound to them. Okay, so the two regulatory subunits remain dimerized together but they have released the catalytic subunits. And moreover, if um, we are talking about a type 2 protein kinase A holoenzyme here, therefore we're talking about two type 2 regulatory subunits here, then um, these dimerized docking and dimerization domains will be attached to an A kinase anchoring protein most likely, and they will remain bound to that even once they've released their catalytic subunits. Okay, now these catalytic subunits are now the active enzyme. Okay, they will go over to proteins and phosphorylate serine and threonine residues. So let me discuss what this means. So let me show you the structure of serine and a threonine residue, and then we'll discuss what phosphorylation entails. Okay, right. So I'm just drawing the core amino acid structure at the moment. So we'll start with serine. So here is the core amino acid structure of just a residue. So here's the amino terminal, here's the alpha carbon, here's the carboxylic acid group, okay? And then um, the R group of a serine residue consists of a methylene group with an alcohol group coming off it. Okay, so this is serine. Now, uh, let's see the difference between serine and threonine. Well, it's, there's very little difference. Here's the amino group. Here's the alpha carbon with a hydrogen coming off. Here's the carboxylic acid group. And then the R group of a threonine residue consists of a single carbon with an alcohol group coming off, a methyl group coming off this carbon as well, and a hydrogen coming off this carbon. Okay, so this is threonine now. Okay, right. So what we're going to do is we're going to stick phosphate groups onto uh, these serine and threonine residues. Now we'll show it for the threonine because, you know, it's going to be exactly the same for the serine. It's just you have to replace this methyl with a hydrogen. Okay, so basically phosphorylation involves putting a phosphate group onto this alcohol group here. Okay, and I'm going to show you this reaction uh, for a inorganic phosphate group, but the reality is that these catalytic subunits are not going to use inorganic phosphate groups from the cytoplasm to stick a phosphate group onto these serine and threonine residues. In reality, they're going to go to ATP. They're going to nick that phosphate group off the gamma, uh, well, they're going to nick the gamma phosphate group of ATP. So let me get my picture back again. They're going to take the gamma phosphate from ATP, leaving ADP, adenosine diphosphate, adenosine with two phosphates, and they're going to put that phosphate group onto the alcohol group. Okay, but I'm going to show you the reaction as though we're doing it from an inorganic phosphate. So, a phosphate group has this structure. It consists of a phosphorus atom at the centre, double bound to an oxygen, then with two alcohol groups coming off the phosphorus atom, and also a single bond to an oxygen atom, which has acquired another electron via ionic means and therefore has a negative charge. Okay, now, what you can do is you can bind phosphate groups to alcohol groups, and this is the motivation of how you can do this. It's very similar, again, to an esterification reaction, because if you look at this group that I'm now encircling in purple here, 
This group with a phosphorus atom at the centre, a double bond to an oxygen, and then an alcohol group. That looks very similar to a carboxylic acid group. In fact, if you replace that phosphorus atom with a carbon, ignore the fact that it's got five bonds coming off it, which is absurd for carbon. Um, but if you just look at the group that I've circled in purple, that looks ex would be a carboxylic acid group if this phosphorus atom was a carbon. Okay, so this carboxylic acid like group can react with alcohol groups uh, in exactly the same way as a carboxylic acid group would, okay, in an ester like reaction. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to take the alcohol group off the phosphorus atom. We're going to take the hydrogen off the alcohol group. We're going to combine those two together to make water. Okay, and we're then going to bind the phosphorus atom of the phosphate group onto the oxygen atom of either the serine or the threonine residue. Okay, so we're going to stick our phosphate group onto our alcohol group. And this link that you now create, which is similar to an ester link, okay, it's known as a phosphoester link. So we've seen phioester links, and now we've got phosphoester links. Okay, but remember in phioester links, you had a carboxylic acid group, and it was the alcohol group that we changed to a thiol group. In this one, we've changed the carboxylic acid group to this phosphate group. Okay, right, and kept the alcohol group the same. So, that's what serine and threonine uh, residues are and what phosphorylation of them entails. Okay, so these catalytic subunits are going to take phosphate groups from um, adenosine triphosphate molecules and bind them onto serine and threonine residues. Now, do they just do this um, to any serine and threonine residue? Well, the answer is no. The serine or threonine residue has to be in a certain sequence of amino acids, okay, in order to let the catalytic subunit know that, um, that this residue needs to be phosphorylated. Okay, so basically, what I mean by this is if we have a polypeptide here, let's say this is the amino terminus, this is the carboxylic acid terminus, um, then the catalytic subunits of protein kinase A do not just phosphorylate every serine and threonine residue within proteins. Instead, they only phosphorylate serine and threonine residues if they're in a certain sequence of amino acids. Now, let me give you an example of one of these sequences. So, they're sequences of four amino acids. So, basically, you need an arginine amino acid followed by another arginine amino acid followed by anything, that's what X means, and then you need either a serine or a threonine. And if you've got a sequence like this within your protein, and that's not the free letter code for threonine, that's the free letter code for threonine, okay? Uh, if you've got a sequence of four amino acids within your protein that looks like this, then the serine or threonine that's in position four here will be phosphorylated by the catalytic subunit of protein kinase A, assuming, of course, that it is exposed to the catalytic subunit of protein kinase A. If it's not exposed to it, i.e. if it's buried deep within the structure of the, uh, the 3D structure of the protein, then of course the catalytic subunit isn't going to be able to see it. Okay, but if it's on the surface of the protein, then it will be phosphorylated. Okay, right. So, um, there are other sequences like this which will cause the serine or threonine that's in position 4 to be phosphorylated. So another example is, for instance, if you have an arginine followed by a lysine followed by anything, and then you've got a serine or threonine in position 4, then the serine or the threonine in position 4 will be phosphorylated there. Okay, another example is lysine, arginine, anything, and then you've got a serine or a threonine. Okay? And then finally, also, if you've got a lysine, lysine, and then anything, serine and threonine. So hopefully you might be able to spot some patterns here. In fact, the only requirement that a serine or threonine residue has in order for it to be phosphorylated is that the two amino acids that are not in front of it, but in front of it, but excluding one, okay? So if you go to the serine and threonine, okay, let's say we've got a residue here, which is a serine and threonine residue, and you want to know, is it going to be phosphorylated? 
Well, the first question you need to ask is, is it exposed to the cytoplasm or is it deeply buried within the structure? If it is exposed, then there is a chance that it will be phosphorylated. Then what you need to ask is, okay, look at the four, sorry, look at the three amino acids prior to it. Okay, these three here. I don't care about the one that's immediately in front of it, but these two here that are uh, two in front of it and three in front of it, okay? These either need to be arginine or they need to be lysine. So if both of these are either arginine or lysine, then it will be one of these sequences, and then that serine or threonine will be phosphorylated. Okay, so each of these two has to either be arginine or lysine. So let me now show you the structure of arginine amino acids and lysine amino acids. So we'll start with arginine, okay? So we'll draw it once again as an amino acid residue. So here's the amino group, here's the alpha carbon, here's the carboxylic acid group, and then the R group of arginine consists of three methylene groups. Okay, and because I'm being lazy, I'm just going to draw one and then bracket it and put a three. Then you have a nitrogen with a hydrogen coming off it, then a carbon, okay, then an amino group coming off that carbon, and a double bond from the carbon to a nitrogen down here with a hydrogen coming off it. Okay, so this is the structure of an arginine amino acid. Okay, and then if we look at the structure of lysine then, at lysine, uh, once again, we'll draw the core amino acid structure here. So here's the amino group, here's the alpha carbon with a hydrogen coming off it, here's the carboxylic acid group, and then the R group of lysine consists of four methylene groups. So once again, I'll just draw one methylene group, bracket it and put four, and then right on the end you have an amino group. Okay, right. So if the amino acids that are two and three in front of your serine and threonine residue are either arginines or lysines, then that will be one of these sequences of four amino acids that uh, tells the catalytic subunit of protein kinase A that the serine or threonine residue needs phosphorylating, and it will then get phosphorylated. Now, this happens to serine and threonine residues in a vast plethora of proteins, and it can modulate the function of that protein, so it can either increase the activity of that protein or decrease the activity of that protein. Okay, so that now concludes our discussion of the adenylyl cyclase protein kinase A pathway.